So welcome to the second morning session. So the first speaker we have is from uh, chemistry uh, on this campus, uh, chemistry department. And so she'll talk to us about the golden nanoparticles in, on, and around cells. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Um, uh, actually, I kind of think of this workshop as really a giant group meeting because so far all the speakers I've seen are doing things that I'm really interested in. So, uh, so thank you for the opportunity here. So I know I have limited time. Uh, so what I want to tell you about today is what we do in my lab. Uh, in the And we are gold people. So we've seen copper. We maybe heard about iron. There's all these other nanoparticles in the world, some silver, some silicon. So we're doing gold. I'll explain why in a minute. And then uh, we're going to think about them at multiple levels in biological systems, uh, spatially, and then uh, even bigger scale than that. So one thing I love about these particles is that uh, we can control their optical properties by controlling their shape. So what I'm showing you here are transmission electron micrographs uh, in set up there, uh, along with the solutions of these particles. So these are aqueous solutions. We make all our particles in air and water at room temperature. So it's a pretty green process, so to speak. And um, uh, what, what you're looking at below is the absorption spectra of these particles. So when we start with uh, so-called spherical looking particles, really they're truncated crystals that look like a sphere uh, in a microscope. Uh, but if we make them, uh, we can get these nice uh, ruby, this, the famous ruby red color that you see on the far left there. And then we've developed uh, methods in my laboratory to make, uh, to turn these little spherical seed-like particles, as we call them, into rod-shaped particles. So when you do that, uh, your one uh, strong absorption band, which we now call, now call a plasmon band, splits into two. So what they, these two bands correspond to is light being absorbed and scattered along the short axis and the long axis of the particle. So as the particle is elongated, the long axis band is moving further and further into the red. And this is very interesting for a biological system because uh, one of the application areas that I'll mention, which I won't talk too much about though, is imaging. And if you want to image things in the so-called water window of tissue, you want to be between something like 750 and 1200 nanometers because water starts absorbing about 1,200 nanometers. So if you want to have a contrast agent or an imaging agent, these particles are great for that. You notice the peaks are pretty broad here. Those are ensemble averages, of course. And if you were able to do a single particle spectrum, it would still be pretty broad, maybe half of what you're seeing right here. So the extinction coefficients for these things are about 10 to the ninth per molar per centimeter on a per particle basis. So on a per object basis, that's about 10,000 times as much light absorbed as a, like a good molecule would be. But of course, there's many more atoms in these rods uh, than there would be in a molecule. So in addition to the strong absorption properties of these particles, they also scatter uh, light really well, elastic light scattering. So if I showed you this picture with no context, you'd probably think it was a galaxy that we're looking at or something. Uh, but in fact, we're looking at a dark field optical micrograph of our particles here. These are rod shaped particles. Again, they're dispersed in a polymer gel. And we're looking in the dark field optical microscope, so white light is coming in, and just we're looking at the elastically light scattered out from the sides. And uh, the field of view here is about three millimeters. So all those little stars in the sky you see there are our uh, particles. And then the misty colors are from the gel because it's kind of turbid. So in other words, you can see where things are. And if you're actually very good at this, you can even pull out uh, what orientation these rods have because uh, they're, the light that is scattered also is reflective of where the positions of the bands were in those absorption spectra. So if they were pointing right at you, long axis this way, they'd be scattering blue, they'd be scattering red, they'd be scattering all different uh, colors depending on the angle. So, um, so it's possible to do single particle optical experiments in this kind of microscope um, in addition to this. I'm not going to talk about the synthesis, even though we have spent 10 years you know, making these particles and understanding their chemistry and how the crystal grows and what the electron diffraction is and all this stuff. I'm going to just skip all that for the purposes of this talk and just tell you that by the end of the synthesis, for no matter how we do it for all these little nanoscale objects, uh, we have this uh, bilayer of a surfactant that we use to control the shape on the particle surface here. So you can kind of see that there. It's a quaternary ammonium head group and then a 16 carbon tail, and we have a bilayer here. So it's actually a very little interesting object all by itself. We've got a bunch of positive charge here. If you measure the zeta potential, it's a highly positively charged thing. We've got a hunk of metal in the middle. We've got a hydrophobic region very close to the metal. So again, this gives you lots of opportunities to do cool things like having molecules stick their feet in there and do all kinds of stuff, So, uh, which I'm not going to have much chance to talk about. In the context of biology, though, then if you were, a, say, a cell and you saw these particles, what would you see? You'd see a whole bunch of quaternary ammonium groups staring at you. And uh, if we want to functionalize a surface, there's many ways we could do that. But our favorite way right now is to do a uh, wrapping procedure, kind of uh, diagrammed on the right there, where we take a polyelectrolyte that has the opposite charge to our particle 
and incubate it. And you have to do this right with the correct molecular weight and so forth. But we can do these wrapping procedures and add layers and layers and layers onto our particles. And then you terminate with functional groups uh, that then you can uh, you know, do to attach things, for example. So if we think about gold and also, I should say, silver nanoparticles, uh, the noble metal nanoparticles that absorb light very strongly and scatter light very strongly, uh, the application space really is huge here. And we've seen some of this already today. On the left, I'm showing you a pie chart of the kinds of applications you can do with these sorts of particles. Uh, chemical sensing is a big piece of the pie there. There's many ways to do that. We saw already a little bit about surface enhanced Raman scattering as a method to detect molecules using what, again, in that experiment, you're sending invisible light and you're looking at the inelastically scattered light from molecules very close to the metal. So you can do potentially single molecule detection that way. But if you want to look at the particles, uh, that these strong absorption bands are tunable depending on the environment. You can, if you change the local refractive index, that gives you a shift. If you change the aggregation state of the particle, that gives you a shift. A bigger shift. So to the extent that you can make those chemically specific, those kinds of events, you have a chemical sensor. Other pieces of the pie that were a little, uh, kind of a little interesting, tracking that little green piece there you see uh, from the dark field optical micrographs that gets you the idea that we can maybe see where things are. Uh, the purple piece of the pie there says drug delivery. That seems like a bad idea. Uh, do we want a hunk of metal delivering our drug? Uh, but actually, it can be more interesting than you think using the red piece of the pie there, which is photothermal therapy. The idea here being that your particle absorbs all this light in the near IR window. If you shine light there, the particle absorbs all this energy. And then what does it do to dissipate that energy? It can convert away as heat to the local environment. And now you have some possibility of doing some targeted thermal stuff. Uh, so I'll give you an example of that later. <laughs> So in all these cool applications that we could be doing with biological systems, there's all these multiple levels of things we have to think about. I'm a chemist, so I'm going to think more from the bottom up, but we have to go ultimately all the way to perhaps the organism level. So for example, a favorite thing that we've already seen people do is they take their nanoparticle and attach a biological molecule to it. That seems pretty straightforward, yet as we'll see, there are some issues with you know, how you might do that, how active is your molecule when it's bound to the surface, etc. In addition to that, when you put your nano object in the media of the cell or the tissue environment or the microvasculature or something, uh, very commonly people would say now you form what's called a protein corona. That is to say all kinds of molecules in the media adsorb to your thing, which is going to probably influence what it can do. We have to think about how well things are uptaken into the cell if we want to go in. Uh, what happens to these nanoparticles in such a context, and then ultimately, what kinds of effects do these particles have on the biological system that we may not be anticipating. So I'm not going to be able to talk about all of these things today, but that just gives you kind of a broad survey of the landscape. So my first little short story here is just thinking at the molecular level. So I'm going to take a molecule here. We're going to, uh, it's an enzyme. So what we're going to do is take this enzyme and we'll put it on our rods that we make so nicely. And we're going to attach it three different ways to our particles. We'll just pick one kind of rod here to, as a platform. Uh, we will quantify how many of these proteins are on the particle, per particle, and then we will measure how active it still is. Okay, so, um, so the protein we're using here is trypsin. Uh, what does trypsin do? It digests proteins, so maybe it's a bad choice in retrospect, uh, but nonetheless, uh, that is what we uh, have data on. So what I'm showing you on the top here is our particle synthesis. I didn't explain that at all, but there's that bilayer up in the upper middle there. And then we do one round of this pi electrolyte layer by layer wrapping to, uh, to display that on the surface of the particle, a bunch of net negative charges at pH 7. So everything's in water here, of course. So we have carboxylic acid groups, uh, which we're going to use later. And then we have sulfonate groups, and those are nice because they're going to keep us negatively charged the whole time. So we never go through the point of zero charge and have stuff aggregate on us in water as we're doing experiments. So here's the three ways to attach. Let me draw your attention to the middle column there, trypsin, that blue object. Trypsin is a small protein, about two or three nanometers, and it's got 11 amines on the surface, so it's net positively charged at pH 7. So the simplest thing to do is the bottom pathway, which is we take our net negatively charged particles, our net positively charged protein, and we mix them together and let electrostatics do everything. And that's what a lot of people do uh, right there with their antibody or you know, whatever. Uh, the middle pathway, we can make amide bonds between the acids and the amines using standard sophomore organic chemistry, EDC coupling, so that's no problem. And then the top pathway is a little more complicated, but it's more trendy if you're a chemist. Uh, it's called click chemistry. Uh, so what we do here is we do an azide alkyne uh, coupling with a copper one catalyst. And all the atoms in the azide, the N3 and the alkyne, the C2 with a triple bond there, end up in this triazole ring. So click is really nice because azides and alkynes are not very biologically around. So if you want to click things together in a biological soup, as long as they can find each other, it's going to be a pretty specific interaction. So how do we get there? We make amide bonds again. Uh, so we go through an amine peg azide going the uh, uh, northwest pathway there. 
and uh, that produces azides all over the particle. And then we take trypsin, react it with pentynoic acid to get triple bonds where those amines are. That doesn't affect its activity at all. And then we go ahead and do this click thing. And there we go. Okay, so these are the three pathways. And the top one was a lot more work, but maybe it's worth it. So if we go ahead and look at the data, uh, and this, again, this is a lot of bioanalytical digestions and extractions and so forth. Uh, how many proteins are on these particles? Okay, these are the, our bigger rods. They're about 500 nanometers long and 20 nanometers wide. Uh, their plasma, their absorption band is way out in the near IR, like way out in the near IR, about 1800 nanometers uh, when we make them that long, past telecommunications wavelengths actually. Uh, a monolayer of this protein on that surface would be about 15,000. So we're about halfway to two thirds of the way filled here, okay, with these different, three different attachment procedures. And then the activity is down a lot here. Uh, especially for the first two methods are sort of similar and then click is was more work you know but it is sort of worth it maybe and that is corrected for how much protein is there now it may not be a totally fair comparison because we had a little bit of a peg chain you may have noticed and peg gives you a little more linker space between the attachment point of the protein and the hard metal surface so maybe there's some steric uh, sterics involved here as well um, and also, let me remind you that since this is an enzyme, it does have an active site, and we have no control over orientation here, so the thing could have gone face down, essentially. So you would expect the, some activity to be lost. But anyway, the click method actually may be advantage here. But by no means can we assume our proteins are 100% active when they are bound to a particle, is one of the messages here. So that's an example of doing, you know, looking at the molecular level on our particles here. Now, if we go to the next level, we go to the cellular level. And here's an example where people uh, like to kill things. Okay, we want to destroy things that are bad. So here we got some pathogenic bacteria. And what we're doing is we are attaching, uh, we're taking our gold particles, we're tuning their shape so they absorb at our laser wavelength now, 785 nanometers. So these are shorter little rods than what I uh, previously alluded to. And we are attaching an antibody, okay, similar chemistry we saw before. We're attaching an antibody. It's going to recognize a bacterium of interest here, which is Pseudomonas arginosa. So the upper left corner looks like maybe one of our particles with little black dots on it, but actually it's the bacterium with those little black things are our particles now on the bacterium surface. So again, uh, with the antibody, you get a lot of loading on these bacteria. And then we come in with our wimpy little laser, which is about 10 laser pointers worth of light, continuous wave and you have your bacteria uh, loaded up with these particles floating around you come in with our 785 nanometer laser and in about 10 minutes you can hear things sizzle uh, which means the particles absorbed all this light and dissipated the energy as heat and you have killed these bacteria so the bottom left panels there are showing you uh, live dead cell staining images so green is alive and red is dead a b and c are controls no light no particles one or the other. D is when you have both particles and light together. So yes, you have killed them. And if you look in the upper right, if we look in the TEM afterwards to these bacteria, we have blown big holes in their cell wall. Okay, so uh, so the idea here is that targeting, if you can get your laser to the right place, uh, targeting can be very effective if you have a high enough concentration of these particles there to uh, produce the right amount of energy. So we are in fact doing more things with this, of course, uh, putting these bacteria in a more realistic context than just floating around in solution. And also thinking about how much energy we have to put in, how many particles are the minimum, you know, stuff like that. So I want to show you a movie here. Uh, so this is unpublished. So this is this is kind of fun. We call this the nanoparticle vacuum. So uptake is an issue here. Uh, we didn't have to go in for that bacteria thing. The particles just had to be on the cell surface. They don't have to go inside to do their damage. Uh, I hope you can see this okay though. This is it's gonna get brighter in a minute as I start it. Uh, what we're gonna see is a dark field optical microscope image. Uh, there's a bunch of little particles, you can't tell what they are exactly, of course. Uh, on the surface, they're immobilized on a surface of a little well. And then we've got some cells, uh, human dermal fibroblasts in this case, crawling around. And what's gonna happen in this movie is that as the cells crawl around, they're gonna be going over this part, this particle is kind of like a little carpet, and they're gonna suck these particles up. So the cells are gonna get brighter and brighter and brighter as we watch this movie. And you're gonna see dark trails left behind where the particles were on the surface. So let me see if I can get this thing to go here. Um, can you see that okay? Okay, so the, the cells are crawling around. This is sped up a little bit, it's not real time. And they're getting brighter and brighter and brighter. And uh, the big hole you're seeing in the cell there, that's the nucleus. So if we want to say the particles are not getting in the nucleus based on this kind of crude imaging, maybe we can say that. Uh, but you see, the, the cells seem okay here, although they're taking up quite a bit of heavy metal, uh, which seems, I don't know why they would want to do that exactly, uh, but they seem to be okay. Um, so again, we're, uh, we're following the lead of many of our colleagues here and trying to figure out, you know, are these cells still healthy, et cetera, as they do this. But so far, we've tried a few different cell types, a few different sorts of particles on a surface now, mobilized first, 
And so far, we haven't found any cells that don't like to do this, which is kind of surprising, I have to say. So if you want to quantify uptake, this is maybe giving you some dynamic information about uptake here. Uh, how, how can you quantify this a little bit more than just counting spots or something? Um, and let's, uh, OK, we're, we're done with the movie now. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's a number of things you can do to image this tube. You can take cells, such as the ones I showed there. You can freeze them, fix them, slice them, and see that things are really inside, as opposed to maybe just on the surface, if you're not sure. And yes, we can see things are inside. In this particular case, we have little spheres there. If you want to quantify the uptake by some other means than uh, a little more rigorous than just watching the movie, you can do things like collect the washings afterwards of the cells and look at depletion of the particles in your media, and that's what that bottom graph is showing you, that basically in an hour for those particular cells, all dispersed now uh, with these particles in solution, uh, things are sort of done in about an hour. Uh, we've also been very interested, though, in looking at how the surface, and this is very much echoes Hong's comments earlier, how the surface affects things like cellular uptake and cellular effects. So what we've got here is we've got our a whole rot library of these rods now, and we have our initial cationic rods. We've done one round of wrapping, in this case with uh, polyacrylic acid, uh, to get net negatively charged. You have net positively charged, net negatively charged. And there's a whole bunch of literature that says possibly incorrectly, that uh, you know, ne negatively charged things are always less toxic, well, are always non-toxic at some level, and cationic ones are always toxic because the cell membrane's net negatively charged and you disrupt the cell membrane when you bind electrostatically. Now, that may be true to some extent, uh, but let's take a look here. So uh, here, here's all our particles again. Here's all they, here they are. We'll go ahead and expose them to various cells. And uh, we've done a triple round of wrapping here. So we've got our original pat positive, our net negative, and then another round of net positive here. So in this experiment, what we've done is we've incubated just one aspect ratio of those rods, uh, the longer ones, with uh, this, these particular cells here. And we're letting them sit there for a long time. Then we're taking the cells and digesting them down and quantifying how much gold is in there by ICP mass spectrometry, which is a really sensitive technique for gold, part per trillion sensitivity. So, and since we know how big the particles are, we can figure out how many particles per cell, as opposed to masses. So I like to think about things in terms of numbers of particles. So the point here, and this is at one time point, so maybe it would change over time. The point here is from left to right, the bars represent positive, negative, positive. So the two outer bars have the same surface charge, different chemical groups responsible for it, but the same surface charge that we measure. And what you see is that there's maybe a few, I don't know, several dozen going in these cells, and the first guy, and then a couple of hundred, and then a couple of thousand. So if we have two orders of magnitude difference in the amount of uptake, this is at one time point, like I said. So if we try to follow this longer and longer, maybe everybody would reach equilibrium at some point. But initially, if you wanted to do things like expose and then wash, you could then, in fact, dose these cells quite differently, depending on what's on their surface. But as we do all these experiments, we also realize, of course, that we've put our particles, net positive, net negative, et cetera, in the media with the cells, and we make our particles in water, and they haven't seen media before. And what I'm showing you at the top here is the zeta potential. So we have our original positive, negative, positive guys, the first three bars there. When you put them in the media without any proteins in the media, the cells don't like that, but they can handle it. You still retain some initial remembrance of your initial surface charge error. You're still positive, negative, positive. But after you incubate with the full media, with the proteins in the media that the cells actually prefer, you all go to the same surface charge in five minutes. Uh, what does that surface charge correspond to? Uh, well, the major thing in the media is bovine serum albumin, and its surface charge is exactly the number you see here. I think it's very interesting, an uh, interesting sort of intellectual dilemma of if the particles are all picking up the same protein, how come they're going in at different rates if they're the same size? Okay, so this becomes a very interesting uh, topic of discussion. So I just want to kind of point this out, that these are things we had to keep track of as we're doing these particle uh, cell experiments. Uh, now I wanted to get bigger scale, okay? So here's the bigger scale. Now we're going to put our cells in a construct that's more like a tissue mm -hmm. and uh, see what these particles do. And this is where things get very, very strange. So in these experiments, these are primary cells, now not cultured cells. These are primary cells uh, from neonatal rat hearts. So these are fibroblasts, cardiac fibroblasts. And uh, from the neonatal heart, they're actually a mix of myofibroblasts and fibroblasts. So fibroblasts make and digest collagen. Myos only make collagen. So there are actually two populations in here. Uh, so what we're looking at is uh, how these cells interact with their matrix, which is collagen. On the left panel, you're seeing these little wells shrinking. That's due to cellular action as the cells remodel their environment, squeeze out water. On the right, you're seeing that the particles are in there. And you notice the little contraction thing has not happened as much. And the, and the ultimate construct looks a little more liquidy. So this ends up a big red flag if you're a cell biologist. These particles have affected, and they are outside here in the matrix. They're not inside the cells. 
It is dose dependent, so the little diameter of the well contracting on the bottom is the original. If we add more particles, they contract less and less and less. We do a whole bunch of experiments to figure out what's going on, and what we find is that the presence of the particles in the outer matrix is affecting these cells at the genetic level. So we're upregulating beta actin involved in motion, downregulating alpha smooth muscle actin involved in motion, downregulating collagen production with vanilla flavored particles out there in the matrix. So this sounds very disturbing. But this is a phenotypic switch that these cells could undergo if they had the right conditions. Now the question is, how are our particles influencing these conditions? There's sort of two things to think about here. Mechanics of the matrix, we got little bits of metal in this soft matrix that could do something. And also, this idea of fizzy absorption of components from the environment, kind of shifting the cell's equilibrium, so to speak, to give it a different chemical milieu in which it's acting. The mechanical part, I'll just say, you can measure stuff, but it's not a huge deal. If you go fishing for what's on the particle's surface after it's gone through all this stuff, we are pulling out all kinds of things, all kinds of things. And uh, so we're in the process now of making like an intellectual loop back to all these things we're finding on the surface, back to those genetic changes that we saw. And as a chemist, we can come back and say, well, how can we test this hypothesis of fizzy absorption of components is affecting things? You can do your, everybody's favorite experiment to resist protein adsorption, which is adding a polyethylene glycol chain to your particles. If you do that, everything ought to go away, even though the particles are still in the matrix, and so far it looks like it's holding up. This is that contraction assay again, and we're just finishing up the mRNA experiments to show that, yeah, uh, they are all looking normal, though. So anyway, very interesting effects that you can get with these particles that are unanticipated, out in the matrix even, not even with even any targeting. So uh, let me conclude by saying here that uh, surface functional relation is very interesting and uh, how you do that might affect the activity of your bound biomolecule. Um, we can get, depending on how you do it, dozens, two thousands, or maybe even more particles per cell, depending on the cell, depending on the particle, et cetera. And then we have this interesting result here that particles out in the extracellular matrix seem to be affecting cellular fate at some level, which is very, very cool. Uh, so I need to thank the students and postdocs in my group who have done the work I just described here, some collaborators, uh, then the second bullet, and then uh, funding from these agencies. And thank you very much for your attention. Okay, question. So, uh, in the last one, the unexpected finding, yep. mm -hmm. Well, so we've so we've tried to fish them out, and there's just very, very, very few. I mean, there's actually not that many in the matrix, and then uh, the cells are all you know sort of mixed up with them, and it's a kind of viscous matrix. So you know, particle diffusion is not going to be an issue here. So right now, we're also trying to do experiments where we have a little one of these gels with cells inside, and then put them in a bigger gel with particles on the outside, so they're really spatially separated. And if we're, we're finding results now where like the cells, you know, they'll migrate out. But if you have particles out here, they do not want to go there. So we're trying to see if this is how statistically real this is. But that's another very interesting finding, which is probably a conglomeration to some extent of mechanics and the desorption stuff. I mean, you know, so these are not things we thought we would ever be studying, but here we are. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned about localizing fat. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you since you have this rod, have a long and short. And have you tried using the size of geometry? Uh, for uptake, you mean, or for the, 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 the cell thing? Yeah. These are the biggest ones we have. Uh, so these are the 600 nanometer long, 20 nanometers wide. The reason we were doing that is because we wanted to do some imaging, and the more metal you have, the better they scatter. So we wanted to image stuff with these particles, and it turns out that that is, you know, we're finding all these weird effects. But have we gone back and tried different things? No, we have not. We should probably, if we do that, though, we have to correct for surface area. So probably we should have like, the same surface area for all these right. little, the, right. That's, what you have to go out that's right, that's right. So, so yeah, we haven't done that, though. Yet. And how are you measuring the attachment of the trypsins and antherons? How are we measuring it? Oh, okay, so um, so there's two different methods we've done. So we know how much trypsin we put into the pot. We do our attachment procedure. The particles there were kind of big. They're easy to centrifuge off. We look at the trypsin left over, and then we go total minus free is bound. Uh, you can also take the particles, uh, you know, incubate them with uh, some chopping agents, essentially, mass spec all the pieces. So that's uh, two independent methods. So laborious, mm -hmm. laborious, yes. Was it a figment of my imagination, or was in your movie, as they picked up more and more particles, were they slowing down? <laughs> okay, I can't say I've noticed this. Um, <laughs> so I, it seems like they should, right? They're, they're, they're so heavy. Right, uh, no. 
No, yeah, we have to we have to do a lot more image analysis right. to make sure we understand what we're looking at here. But so far, the qualitative, you know, first pass of you know, of this is very interesting because most people, I mean, we can't really find anybody who's put things down on a surface that are pickupable. Right? There's lots of you know corrugated you know, scale surfaces with cells having different things happen to them, but if they can suck up the particles from an initial immobilized point of view. You know, uh, we, we, it's just very recent data, so, you know, I'm somewhat clueless, I have to say. Some cells look elongated, too. Yeah, the... yeah, yeah. Actually, there's, I've seen another movie like this from another group where they have found that the cell, they, they, they look, go much longer times and they wait till the cells divide. And that the cells, uh, they have done something different to get particles in there. But when the cells divide, they take particles with them. Like, mm -hmm. the cell is full of particles, and then when it divides, the daughter cells are also full of particles. That's kind of interesting too. <laughs> okay. Let's thank the speaker.